Press. Hello and uh, welcome. I'm your host, Joanne Dong of the SI Toronto Hub. I'm speaking from Toronto, the land of the traditional territory of and home to many diverse Indigenous nations in Canada. It is my great honor and pleasure to be speaking with Malini Goodchild, an Anishinaabe Ojibwe scholar in complexity science, systems thinking, and social innovation in Ontario, Canada. We'll be exploring relational systems thinking, the sacred space between Indigenous and non-Indigenous ways of thinking and knowing, and exploring pathways to bring together the hearts and minds of all knowledge seekers who hope to heal the current systems. The session will start with Malini introducing herself and um, um, the tea ceremony. Uh, then uh, Malini and I will have a conversation. Uh, we will have quest uh, time for questions uh, towards the end. Please uh, submit your questions in the chat. My co-host, Narayan Wong, will be monitoring the chat and will facilitate uh, the question period uh, for at least uh, 10 uh, minutes uh, towards the end. Hello, Malini. We are very grateful for having you. Uh, can we start by you introducing yourself and perhaps um, lead us to the tea ceremony? Thank you. Miigwech, mm Joanne. -hmm. So Mino Gijap, that's good morning. Bonjour and dinner Maganaduk. That's greetings to you, all of my relatives. Anishinaabe Kweyanda, I'm Anishinaabe. Also, uh, we are known as Ojibwe or Chippewa, um, Salto in, in some regions. Uh and Dodem, I'm Moose Clan, Biktagong Nishabe Donjava, uh Kedagonzi with Donjava. Those are the two First Nations I'm from in Northern Ontario. Wabskio Gichida Kwe Zanang Indigenous Cause, Waba Nang Kwe Indigenous Cause. Those are the names I'm known uh, by in the spirit world. And Malani, Indigenous Cause Jaganashi Ayang. That's how I'm known in English. Malani, named after my dad Delaney, my late dad, and my mom Melinda. They halved it up and, and spelled it like Melanie, but it's uh, pronounced Mulaney. And we're here in our home. Welcome to our, our tea room, our humble tea room in our home here. We are in uh, Crystal Beach, which is in the Niagara region of Ontario. And this is traditional Haudenosaunee Confederacy territory and the Three Fires Confederacy, which are the Potawatomi, Odawa, and Anishinaabe. But this is not my home territory. I'm a visitor here. Uh, we are soon moving home to Bawating. So these would be some of our last few sessions here. Uh, before we head back to Northern Ontario. And I just wanted to, to say uh, thank you to everyone for, for joining us today and acknowledge uh, where you are also situated, the lands, the ancestors there, uh, to all of the elders past, present uh, and future of your peoples. And um, thank you for uh, listening. So Apichigo Miigwech Bizin Damiyag, that means thank you for listening. And so I thought uh, we would start with our, our tea ceremony. And this is my husband, Sly, and, and he will be introducing himself as well and leading us through a practice that has come to be moshkiki, which means medicine for us. This is really a deep spiritual uh, practice and very healing for us. And it is a, a tea ceremony that honors the teachings of our relatives in the East. So this comes from our brothers and sisters in China. We also have teachings from Japan. Um, but Sly will speak to that. He's a certified tea specialist studying with a, a tea master from Beijing. Um, but also this is part of our indigenous culture. And, and that's how I'm going to talk about relational systems thinking in a bit after this with Joanne. So I'll, I'll turn it over to Sly to lead us through this ceremony. And if you have your kettles standing by or a cup of tea, you can have that ready so that we'll drink our tea together. Miigwech. Uh, bonjour, everyone. Ojashko wasi benesi nishdekas, makate maying and nishdekas, megaseni dodam, algonquins of Ontario and Dojiba. My name in the spirit world is Blue Shining Thunderbird in English. I'm just known as Sly, good enough. Uh, today, I want to welcome you all to Pubu Chaguan, which is the tea house by the waterfalls, since we are near um, Niagara Falls. And uh, I would like to serve you tea today in the old fashioned way that our cousins in the East and China have uh, been doing for over 5,000 years. 
um, like Melanie said, um, we gravitate easily towards the tea because it's mushkiki medicine. And to that end, it helps us understand systems, systems thinking, because it helps us be in balance to all four quadrants. I'm not going to speak a lot today. I'm going to let the tea do the speaking. I will just serve you tea in silence. And if you do have tea, you can start your kettle, get your water boiling so that when we're done, we can uh, slurp together. And slurping is considered good manners when you're having tea, unlike what we have learned here in North America. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to awaken all the helpers, the actors. The first actor is the water, which has been boiling. I will awaken my helpers in front of me. And the last actor is the tea. We will awaken him and we will enjoy.
To all of you around the world today, wherever you may be, I offer you, my honored guest, the first cup of tea. Here so you can see it. Single shot. Enjoy your tea. The tea that we're enjoying today is a oolong tea from Yui Mountain. It's a white cox comb, combs comb. There is a legend that, but it's a little bit longer. So if you have the privilege and uh, the time to join us for another tea session one day, we can uh, go into the tea of the etiquette and so on. So for now, it was a pleasure meeting all of you. Thank you for visiting us. And I'll pass it back to Melanie as I make more tea for everyone. Miigwe Sly, can I ask you before I start to um, share the teaching of how to hold the tea bowl and why we hold it like that? Sure. The, uh, the tea bowl is usually picked up in your dominant hand from the top and it's brought into your non-dominant hand, which is nice and flat. It's put on the fingers, and then the thumb comes up this way. In your dominant hand, you wrap your index finger and your thumb on the rim, just enough for you to bring your lips to the rim. So we hold the teacup at heart level and we bring it up to our lips by bringing it up to the lips and tilting, it mixes in with our head, which are the brain. So together, we now have a method of connecting the brain and the heart together as we ingest whatever information, whatever we're reading, whatever we're hearing, especially the sacred words from the elders or anybody else in the teaching lodge. So it's from here to the lips and back down. And this is something that you can do in your practice. You have a small cup, whether you have a larger cup. And even if there's a handle to your cup, you can take from the bottom top, depending on how big, and use the rim and just drink from here. Oh, my gosh. <clears throat> I'm going to say a few words in Anishinaabe Moin. Um, to thank the spirits for being with us for this ceremony. Uh, this is um, a real privilege for us and an honor to be able to respect a culture that's different from ours. Often as indigenous peoples, we are being asked to share our culture um, and we do that quite frequently, but this is the medicine, uh, the mushki ki, we say, the medicine that has helped us personally in our family, so. Miguich Gajim Anato Gemiji Ayang and Nishnabe Mino Bamatsuin, Miguich Skakamakwe Gemiji Ayang, the Vish Gemiji Ayang Majim, Miguich Skakamakwe Skakamakwe Gemiji Ayang Niswin. And so I thank the Creator for giving us a good life, and I thank Mother Earth for giving us the water uh, that we use for this Camellia sinensis, this tea. And there's a deep tea culture in Nishnabe. Uh, many Anishinaabe culture, um, cultural protocols. We have medicine, uh, we have Labrador tea, uh, which we call, you know, some people call swamp tea. Um, cedar tea is a very powerful medicine, but the Camellia sinensis plant that uh, Sly was talking about, this comes from China. And often we drink old growth, Puar is one of our favorite um, teas. And that old growth tree 
is a mushkiki that picked the human beings. And so there's so much resonance between uh, the culture that, that we learn about through tea in, um, in the East and, and our culture. And so that's what relational systems thinking is. And so maybe I'll just offer a couple of opening comments as Joanne and I head into to dialogue. I, I wrote an article, I published an article called Relational Systems Thinking. That's how change is going to come from our Earth Mother. And I, I wrote that together with uh, four Haudenosaunee knowledge keepers. Uh, Dr. Dan Longboat, Diane Longboat, Rick Hill, who's Tuscarora, and Kevin Deer, who's a faith keeper in the Mohawk Longhouse from Ganawage. Um, and Rick and uh, Diane and Dan are from Six Nations of the Grand River. And being here in this territory, which is not my home territory, I wanted to learn from, you know, the local culture, Haudenosaunee peoples. And so they taught me about the Two World Wampum Belt, which is the first treaty between the the newcomers uh, who were the Dutch at the time in the 1600s and later followed by the French and the British. And they signed this treaty, which, which was known uh, back then as uh, the treaty with the Iroquois Confederacy, but it's really the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. And in that teaching of the two world wampum belt, the river of life is made up of these white beads. And then there's two columns of purple beads, these sacred wampum shells. And those two columns represent these two vessels. So the Dutch merchant sailing ship and the Haudenosaunee birch bark canoe. And it was a, it was a treaty of peace, uh, friendship and respect, but it was also the recognition that those were distinct, equal yet differentiated cultures. And so in the article, I present uh, that teaching in a two row visual code as you go back and forth uh, and to see what I'm sharing. But really what it is, is a teaching about balance about peaceful coexistence. And there's a, an elder from Peru named Arkan Lashwala, and he talks about in his culture, they don't have the binaries that we have, that we hear about in English, you know, black, white, good, bad, you know, which really kind of predisposes us to choose sides. In his culture, there's not neat opposites like that often. And so he talks about dancing with two um, opposing ideas or opposite ideas until the presence of a third shows up. And that's what uh, we have found when we offer uh, tea sessions. We, we are very careful about appropriation that uh, to let people know how we came about this knowledge and, and who taught us this, but also that it's the space in between and so relational systems thinking is about using a, a systems thinking lens, a holistic way of thinking, uh, but, but dancing in that space between two knowledges. And so it's, it's a unique approach to decolonization, for example, uh, to doing systems change work. And it represents uh, the, the how of that. Uh, so much Indigenous knowledge uh, discussions often center on the what, which is really important, but then how do you do that in an ethical way? So that space between the two ships, the, the birch bark canoe and the ship, that's the space in between what Willie Ermine, a Cree scholar, calls ethical space. Uh, Dan Longboat, my uncle Dan, calls it sacred space. And I've called it relational systems thinking. That's, that's the process of uh, bridging worldviews in, in an ethical way uh, it's very relationship-based, uh, local context, and it's also very embodied. I really feel that to uh, shift consciousness, that we have to be in tune with our bodies. This is our first system we're aware of, and our bodies exist within relationship to all of our kin, which is natural. And uh, that is how the tea ceremony came to us, because we have our teachings of fire and water, for example, that there's... Uh, in my culture, our culture, there's fire, men are the fire keepers and women are the water keepers. And so too much of one um, will destroy the other. So too much water will put out a fire and too much fire will evaporate the water. And so there's a real teaching of balance in that. And so I love this thing. Why I, uh, and I'll just wrap up by saying this beautiful teaching of heart and mind is so important because those are very important. I don't think it's about one over the other. It's about the peaceful coexistence that you're often maybe intellectually gifted, but if you're staying in the intellect and not feel heart and the emotions in this work we call social innovation, uh, then you might be out of balance. And I think in that balance is where some of the most um, probably unique innovations might reside. So thank you for listening and I'll turn it back to Joanne. 
Thank you so much, Melanie, and thank you, Sly, for the tea ceremony and for showing us tea. And I think food in general as medicine, um, as, as a source of healing and rebalancing uh, instead of uh, simply as uh, vitamins, proteins, and minerals. And thank you for that. Um, Melanie, you beautifully summarized relational system thinking, uh, the dance, the space of, of this delicate dance between the two systems. And your life and work uh, very much breed through the two opposite knowledge and value systems, the indigenous land-based relational system and um, the Western mind-based objective system. And I wonder if you could share how you see and experience the two um, systems and reconcile their relationships, uh, especially after um, the injustice and violence Western civilization has inflicted upon all indigenous peoples, their cultures and worldviews, um, and their kin, Mother Earth. Thank you. Hey, Rich. Yeah, so for, for me, I'm a scholar of systems and complexity, so I'm a, a graduate student. Uh, um, wrapping up my PhD in social and ecological sustainability at the University of Waterloo. And I'm a fellow at the Waterloo Institute for Social Innovation and Resilience. And when I first started studying uh, climate science and ecological economics and really started to become aware of, you know, this concept of sustainability in the West, it really struck me how from my own perspective, so my own uh, cosmology and epistemology, or we say in our language, Ishnabe, uh, Gikindasu in our original ways of knowing and Indamu in our wisdom, that it was very different. Uh, in fact, it was almost uh, opposites. And so, for example, the title of my program, Social and Ecological Sustainability, that separation that continues in a lot of uh, Western, I think, discussions of, say, climate science, biodiversity loss, and, you know, these environmental problems. I remember asking an elder back home, Albert Hunter from Rainy River First Nations, I said, I've never really heard our elders talk about nature or wilderness or environment or the biosphere. I said, when we talk, how do we say that? And he said, we say gedakimanan. Gedakimanan means everything in creation. That, that's how it translates. And so in Nishnabema, when we have word bundles and, and word Word bundles are what uh, linguists call a hollow phrase. English doesn't really like that very much. English is very precise, kind of low context. Nishnabe Mawin is very land-based, context-specific. Uh, and so a hollow phrase is a word bundle. And it means a really long definition. And so Gida Kimenan means everything in creation, the sun, the moon, the stars, the water, the fire, the, the mountains, the deserts, you know, the oceans, the animals, uh, the winged ones, the ones that crawl, all of those beings. The Haudenosaunee talk about that as well in their Thanksgiving address, the words that come before all else. If you've ever had the honor of hearing uh, the Haudenosaunee elders when they start their, their, their talks. And so for us, Gidath Kimenan is the concept of there is no separation between uh, human beings and nature. We are all part of creation. So we are in Dinawamag and Aduk, we are all related. You are my relatives. And when I say greetings to you, my relatives, I'm also greeting all of the spirit beings that live with us here, our helpers, our eagle fans and drums and, you know, those kind of helpers, the, the elements that are helping us today, the water and the fire that have helped us and all of the beings outside here, the trees outside. And so that Gida Kimenan is an important distinction, I think, that I had to reconcile the fact that I was learning about a different way of looking at the world, that I was learning this environmental way of looking at the world from a Western perspective, which really had distinct um, values, a different value system. And to make sense of that, I, I talked to elders. I ask about how would we say something in our language, because language encodes our, our teachings, our values. And I also um, look at knowledge a bit differently. So in, in our culture, knowledge is not owned. It is not the possession of someone purely of the intellect. It's actually resides on the land and it's revealed to you through personal experiences on the land so that you go out on the land and then you will be taught something. You know, land is first teacher. I've seen other Anishinaabe scholars write about that. And so 
I'll just share really quickly when I was doing my comps, which is writing a big uh, 10,000 word essay for my comprehensive exams, I was studying resilience and I heard the definition of resilience from C.S. Hollings, you know, the capacity of a, of a complex uh, adaptive system to absorb a shock and not flip into something unrecognizable. And so that would happen if a lake died, for example, if a lake just suddenly you know, dried up and became a desert, it would be like unrecognizable as its former self. And so I thought of that definition and I reached out to other language speakers, uh, to my cousin Renee Mishaki and my sister Eleanor Skeed. And Renee said it's uh, resilience in our language would be Sibiskagad, which is a river flowing flexibly through the land. And Eleanor Skeed, she sent me uh, Mama Sinjige, uh, which is the quick twists and turns of the river as it goes around, you know, the, the features of the landscape. And so they both, two different language speakers of two different dialects and two different locations who don't know each other, uh, came back to me and defined resilience um, after hearing the C.S. Hollings definitions, uh, defined it as the river flowing flexibly through the land. And I think it's a beautiful teaching. Um, and a way that I was able to reconcile that, yes, there's something that I can take from the C.S. Hollings definition. I understand what a complex adaptive system is, but then I also understand the teaching I'm getting from the elders. And so that's why I ended up writing a paper about relational systems thinking, because it's the space in between those two definitions. That's, that's a so beautiful. Thank you, Melanie. Um, uh, that just uh, lead to so many questions, but I, I, I really like the term relational system thinking. It emphasizes the system thinking as relational instead of cognitive, objective. And therefore, I think the term expands uh, system thinking to multiple dimensions and perspectives, not just a, a mental uh, exercise a mental aspect, but also emotional, physical, and uh, spiritual. Um, so you describe uh, relational system thinking as this secret dance. So the notion of a secret space. So this, you know, it, it's really the concept in complexity science. When two things interact, something comes out that it's different from the two um, systems. Um, but then you use the word the secret space. So this brings out an important and yet often neglected philosophical aspect of complexity sciences and system thinking. Um, most Western complexity and system uh, scientists shy away from it, uh, you know, including say the Santa Fe Institute, they take a purely computational approach to complexity. So why um, system thinking and complexity theory can be a form of a spiritual practice? And why is that important to learn from uh, the indigenous knowledge system? Thank you. Miigwech. Mm, so, you know, when you're when you're a young indigenous scholar, when I say young, meaning I'm, you know, new to uh, to some of this knowledge, um, we really stand on the shoulder of giants. And what I've learned from the indigenous scholars that have come before me, particularly the Native American Academy, uh, where Leroy Little Bear, uh, who's a Blackfoot elder, is a part of that. And he participates in something called the Bohm Dialogues based on David Bohm and, and you know, theoretical physics. And in our culture, what systems thinking and complexity does is it helps us understand that what is a feature of the underlying, the unseen, like systems thinking is so much about the unseen, that what is unseen is actually in constant motion. It's in flux and it has a spiritual nature or energy. And I think this you know, is common in the East as well. Like when we talk about the chi of tea, um, that energy and those teachings are really something that was left out of the enlightenment uh, coming out of that, the disenchantment of the world really did, I think, all of humanity, uh, in my opinion, a, a disservice because we lost touch with those sacred teachings that we all had, that all of our cultures had around the world, that connection to Mother Earth. I was speaking to a scholar in Switzerland, for example, who was telling me a few weeks ago about 
her grandmother talking about the water sprites, the little beings that live and how the energy of the forest shifts during the day. But that became um, demonized, you know, it was, it was considered pagan and, and inappropriate. And people who talked about like that, you know, were talking about make believe things. And so from indigenous knowledge, there's a real resonance from uh, the, the teachings of our elders who talk about energy and flux. They talk about the frequencies that we need to tap into, the frequencies of Mother Earth, spiritual, mental, physical, and emotional frequencies. These types of practices help us tap into those frequencies um, so that our heart and minds are connected, our bodies activated. I think there's ancient, uh, my sister talks about blood memory, you know, there's ancient DNA memories that are activated that are not really part of our conscious awareness. We just feel it. We feel really good when we do something like walk through the forest and, and touch a tree or sit by the water or we smell um, something that evokes, you know, an emotional reaction. And so what, what I found is in terms of complexity, and I've studied, you know, complexity science, but also looking at native science. So, so Tiawa scholar, he's Pueblo, Dr. Gregory Cajete has written a beautiful book uh, that I cite all the time called native science. And there is empirical knowledge. There is a method to that from an indigenous perspective. But what's I think a key difference is there is also the recognition of the unseen that that you cannot measure, you cannot see, you cannot prove as being equally valid to that that which you can see and prove. And I think Leroy has has said in a in a book called Blackfoot Physics, uh, David F. Pete, uh, who's an Italian physicist, that um, those are the two knowledge systems that come the closest. So if you're interested in Western knowledge, um, in particular in indigenous knowledge, looking at you know quantum entanglement and quantum potential that really resonates with our concepts of everything being in flux uh, as Leroy says uh, and everything having a spirit we say manadu the manadu the spirits so there's a spiritual nature to things and in our ceremonies we we call that forth and so when Sly and I introduced ourselves when we spoke what we can of our language and we said our spiritual names, we actually invoked and invited our spiritual presence to be here with you. And that's why we follow that cultural protocol of an introduction. And we say our clans and where we're from, what our nation is and what our spirit names are, because we're actually inviting our spirits to be here as well. Because um, they might be, you know, we need to connect to them ourselves. And so we're always reminded of that connection. And that's why we have what we call helpers. You heard Sly talk about helpers. Our spirit helpers are those tangible um, beings like eagle feathers or like tea and, and tea bowls. These all help us to uh, connect because as human beings, we have a rational mind and our rational mind we're taught is actually the part of our consciousness that that uh, sort of disavows those, those spirit beings because we can't see them. Um, and yet I would say, uh, I would actually question how rational we are if we don't believe in those spirit beings that have helped our, our people, meaning human beings for thousands and thousands of years. Thank you so much for sharing those. Those, um, really resonated with me. Um, I came from a, an academic family. Uh, my dad is a math professor, my mom's a chemistry professor, so definitely learned, even though I grew up in China, we didn't learn the traditional ways of thinking. But then I remember one thing we debated at home is where did mathematics come from? And my dad would say, clearly it's from divine. Who proved the one plus one is equal to two? Physics, chemistry, modern sciences are all, you know, predicated on mathematics. So I always had something in my mind that there's a something invisible something unseeing but somehow we have accepted them as universal laws and natural laws and proceeded based on these universal laws and natural laws and the indigenous worldviews and wisdom uh, you know constantly reminded me of how wise and intelligent indigenous people have always been 
to be able to see the unseen, uh, the hidden forces, the invisible networks, you know, for example, the traditional Chinese medicine's meridian network, uh, Western medicine would say it doesn't exist because they've used the modern uh, imaging technologies to try to find out where are the hundreds of uh, pathways and say, no, it doesn't exist, but people practices acupuncture is based on it. So this leads me actually to my uh, next question around how we can learn from the indigenous worldviews, especially the underlying natural laws and principles without perceiving, approaching, or learning about the systems from the lenses of modern science. I, I, I uh, come across terms uh, from newspaper articles, research papers, even terms such as indigenous ecological knowledge, indigenous engineering knowledge. Um, for example, a National Geographic article from 2018, um, here I quote, I actually wrote it down, it says, lands occupied by indigenous peoples who make up only 5% of the world's population contain 80% of the world, world's biodiversity, end quote. And it went on to say how Western sciences has yet to catch up with indigenous ecological knowledge. But indigenous, indigenous knowledge doesn't categorize um, knowledge into ecology, um, um, engineering, uh, medicine, health. Um, and again, I'm drawing parallel from uh, traditional Chinese medicine uh, or TCM. Um, uh, sadly, TCM today is taught in uh, China in medical schools as uh, very much from the lenses of Western medicine uh, without the foundational Taoist principles. So as a result to TCM, it's reduced to being alternative remedies and interventions whenever Western medicine fails um, to produce any result. So I'm sorry for the long winding question. So my question is, how can indigenous knowledge shed light on the crisis we face as interconnected, interrelated and interdependent and not separate issues of uh, specific systems like uh, chronic illnesses are health issues of your human, of your body part. Poverty and inequality are problems of the social system. Climate change is an ecological or environmental problem. So, 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 so how can we collaborate with indigenous people for long-term solutions as opposed to uh, short-term fixes? Thank you. Mm, you great. No, well, thank you for the way that you frame that question, because that that really is an experience that I found as well with, you know, traditional ecological knowledge, TEK within ecology. And just as you talked about Chinese medicine, what happens is those are presented, studied, categorized. There's taxonomies created from a Western perspective to to understand those. And so so the decompartmentalization that systems thinking is trying to address uh, continues to happen. And so. You know, when I first started studying sustainability science, I saw indigenous scholars long before me critiquing TEK as the compartmentalization of what ecologists wanted to find was ecological knowledge or local knowledge of the environment. And while those are elements, those are very spiritual teachings. So, you know, uh, like, for example, something like ethnobotany. Yes, we can understand the teachings of plants and what those plants do, but to decolonize that is to actually understand what those were called by our peoples um, originally and, and how those came to be relatives and what they have, because there's, you know, you could spend a lifetime studying one plant, you know, within our, within our culture, how to harvest it, grow where it comes from, what medicinal properties it has. And so when, when I first saw TEK, um, when I first saw TEK, I, I did find it to be um, something that was uh, reifying or re-embedding or colonizing knowledge in an attempt to actually say it was decolonizing knowledge. And so if we look at the decolonial lens and to truly be decolonial, I think there's a shift in consciousness. And the perfect example is the anthropocentric bias of uh, English as, as a language um, and 
some of the, the sciences that are addressing you know, big problems. So when we think about English, for example, is very noun-based, Nishnabe Mawin is verb-based. And so as a verb-based language, things have animacy, the trees, the rivers, the mountains have animacy, they're sentient beings. In English, when they're a noun, a tree is an it, it's, it's easier, I think, in many ways to, to commodify it, to you know, sanction its destruction. Whereas in our language, it's like, it's, you know, as um, I'll quote Leroy Little Bear again, uh, Blackfoot elder, you know, he says, very different to have a relationship with the wind as your kin than it is to study the wind, you know, as a noun. And so I think the anthropocentric bias is, is a huge part of the need to address in healing self and systems. And so the focus on healing is really important as well, because a lot of that disconnect from earth, disenchantment of the world, you know, kind of happened like before our generations and it's continued on and it's accepted in, in what we study in the disciplines, for example, at university, that compartmentalization of knowledge. And so the, the attempt to bring um, irreducible wholeness back to life was brought on through, I think, systems thinkers, general systems science, gestalt, all of those teachings. But Anishinaabe uh, in Damawin, our wisdom was that that was all interconnected. And so, you know, how do we engage with that interconnectivity, I guess, is, is a really key point. And I think that challenging uh, the anthropocentric nature of things. And so, for example, when I talked to climate scientists, um, I, I did a, a keynote address at the Stockholm Resilience Center uh, in 2017, and they had put out the planetary boundaries framework and, you know, others had, had coined the term the Anthropocene. But we live in a time of prophecy. And so from many of our indigenous cultures, so the Hopis, the Haudenosaunee, the Code of Handsome Lake, from the Anishinaabe, uh, William Kamanda from Kitiginzibi in Quebec was the wampum belt keeper for the seven fires prophecy. We live in a time of prophecy. And so one of those prophecies that we're living in now was that we needed to change course. And actually there was a Hopi elder, Thomas Binyanka, who went to the house of Micah, which is the United Nations in 1992, I believe. And Orrin Lyons, a, a faith keeper here, um, was 93 years old, went with him, and they addressed the United Nations, unfortunately to most, mostly an empty house, but they talked about the shift in course that needed to happen for human beings in order for life to continue on Mother Earth, in order to save our Earth Mother. And that is a, a similar prophecy to the Seven Fires prophecy, where the Ashkemadizig, the new people, would have to be uh, in a relationship with Mother Earth and with each other from like a decolonized perspective. And they didn't use that word back then, my ancestors, but in a relationship of mutual respect and benefit. And that we would sort of reach a point of maturity where we could learn from each other instead of, you know, being so polarized and afraid of, of differentiation. And so the, the Seventh Fire Prophecy would said there would be the Ashkemadizig, the new peoples, and these new peoples would come from the four directions, the black, red, yellow, white. Um, those are the four sacred colors. They represent the great nation. So black, red, yellow, white are the great nations that we would come together and we would teach each other. And in the article, my uncle Dan Longboat talks about that. He says, we share the river of life, meaning all human beings and all of creation share the river of life, but the river is now in jeopardy and it behooves us to work with each other to find ways to do that work together in a respectful way. And that's what, you know, relational systems thinking is kind of like a, um, I'm writing a new article right now and I'm presenting it as the how of, you know, the, the first article maybe was the what, relational systems thinking. The how is, it is a uh, dynamic interface, theoretical living model for reasoning synergistically in the space between, which is a lot of words, but those are all from a lot of um, actually Australian scholars, like my friend Tyson Young Comporta, who wrote Sand Talk, How Indigenous Thinking Can Save the World, a fantastic book I highly recommend on Audible, so you can hear him read it. Uh, but he talks about five minds, and one of those minds is ancestor mind. Another mind is, is kinship mind. Another mind is um, pattern mind. And pattern mind is effectively systems thinking. But the way he defines it, it is about understanding the patterns of nature and Mother Earth and then learning from those to do problem solving. So 
Um, so he's talked about that. And that I think is what's really critical is, is to be humble in those relationships, seek out, you know, indigenous uh, knowledge keepers and not, and, and be conscious of when we, including myself, somehow re-embed injustices, inequalities, and um, assumptions of, of mainstream, you know, ways of knowing into that work, uh, which happens particularly at universities because of all their rules, you know, what is an elder? Are they really a scholar? They don't have a PhD. You know, all of that, we don't want to re-embed um, re those mistakes in, into our work. And so that's what, uh, what I've tried to do in, in my approaches and you learn lessons, you know, sometimes you violate protocols. It's not intentional, but as, as long as you address those violations, then you can move forward in a good way. Thank you. Thank you so much, Malini. Um, there just is so much to think and reflect. There's so many points I took down. And also from your uh, paper, by the way, uh, this is uh, uh, the paper that we've been talking about. It's, uh, you can uh, download it from the Journal of uh, Awareness-Based uh, Systems Change. Um, so I, I, I think I only have time for one more short question. So I have so many questions, um, but I, I, I think your uh, comment leads nicely to something that Otto Schammer uh, made uh, a civilizational shift from uh, ecosystems, the Western individualized ecosystems to um, uh, very much traditional indigenous eco um, systems. And uh, there's another question that I hope if you could touch on is it's language. You did mention that it, indigenous languages are often uh, verb based and, and the English language it's it's uh, uh, non based. Uh, when you said that it reminds me of the late uh, St. Lucian poet Nobel Literature Prize winner Derek Walcott, uh, who wrote about post colonial uh, societies in South America. In his poem North and South, he said, it's good that everything's gone, except their language which is everything. So what kind of impact the languages may have on uh, this secret space, the collaboration interactions between uh, indigenous knowledge systems and, and uh, Western knowledge systems. And uh, uh, what, you know, in terms of the civiliz civilizational shape that, that, that is happening and what um, um, can we do about it? And after this question, uh, we will open the floor for all these questions. Thank you so much, Malini. Thank you, Rich. Yeah, so in, in the, the paper, the co-writers with me were those four Haudenosaunee knowledge keepers, but also Peter Senge and Otto Scharmer, colleagues of mine at, at MIT. Uh, you know, Peter wrote a book called The Fifth Discipline and Otto wrote a book called Theory U. And I work with, uh, both of them. So I'm an advisor to the Systems Awareness Lab, the new a new lab at MIT that Peter um, is getting off the ground, and also to the Presidency Institute. Uh, I've done quite a few uh, webinars with either both, either of them, or, or both of them. And so we recorded something called the Dialogues on Transforming Society and Self Thoughts webinar in 2019, the fall of 2019, and it was capped at 500 participants, and it was myself. Uh, Peter Otto and uh, Kelby Bird, who does the, the scribing. And in that DOTS webinar, I think there were 500 people from 56 countries and seven continents. And we talked about prophecy, we talked about language, and we also talked about that civilizational shift. And so Otto, in Theory U, if, if anyone's familiar with that, he does talk about, um, he uses the metaphor of a smartphone. And he says, when people are doing systems change, you know, often what we're really doing is we're just creating another app on the smartphone, but we're not fundamentally shifting um, those systems. And so what that requires is an upgrade in the operating system completely. So he has a model and he talks about OS 1, 2, 3, and 4. And OS 1 is, you know, really kind of ego driven. And then you progress to OS 4, which is more uh, ecosystem centric. 
and and he has this model where he talks about you know the education system, the governance system, um, you know capitalism, the economy, healthcare, for example. What was interesting is when I first heard that that model, uh, he was presenting it. We were at a workshop uh, called the Executive Champions Workshop in Stowe, Vermont, in 2019. And I, I put up my hand and I said, I said to Otto, I said, you know, it strikes me that 4.0 really represents what we had, Indigenous peoples had before contact. We had intact systems of health that focused on well being. You know, we had these holistic uh, processes, we had governance structures through our clan system, like the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and for us, a clan system. And so I said, maybe there is something in that in terms of the shift from eco to ego. And I think in the language, uh, what I shared before, the animacy of these beings, if human beings think we're at the top of the pyramid of creation, and that all of creation is just here to serve us, then we can be as reckless as we want until we destroy the planet, which is the, you know, the path that we're on. But if instead we're in relationship to the kin and we're grateful you know, to this water, for example, um, we don't survive without water. And it, everything was gifted to us here on Mother Earth to survive, but we've continued to mediate that relationship through uh, almost like intermediaries, you know, like we, we have houses with heat and, and air conditioning. And so, you know, what's the temperature outside? What's the season? Our food is a perfect example um, around food sovereignty and global food systems and, and big, you know, agriculture business. Like what's in season right now? I don't know, because I go into my grocery store and everything's there. And maybe if it's out of season, it's a little more, it costs more. But we know the cost of producing that kind of food on the scale, the trillions, trillions of sea life that's killed every year. Uh, to feed humans and the billions of animals that are slaughtered every year to feed humans. All of that, I think, requires a complexity mindset because it's really overwhelming and it's heartbreaking, right? And so I think the spiritual nature of, of Indigenous languages, um, we can learn from that for sure, but just also that, you know, human beings are all Indigenous to Mother Earth somewhere. And so relational systems thinking for me wasn't about the continuation of othering, you know, oh, this is white supremacist culture, this is indigenous culture, one's good, one's bad. It's actually about whatever are those two roles for you. It could be the humanities and the sciences, because I mean, that's a huge, you know, divide for some people in some programs where the humanities are just, oh, it's a novel. Nope, that's not real, <laughs> you know, science or education versus you know, the hard sciences, let's call them, or, or STEM or STEAM. Um, and so I've done quite a bit of work actually with engineers, with scientists, with lawyers, and that's where Willie Ermine is a lawyer, the Cree scholar who talked about ethical space. It's about when these worldviews come together, we don't want it to be a clash. We don't want it to be violent. We don't want it to be othering and, and making people aware of their uh, power and privilege and skin color and differences. That, that serves a, a purpose to a certain point when there's unequal power dynamics, so, so social justice. Um, but I think what, what most, I would think, activists and, and scholars were looking for is, and then what? Like, when do we, when do we get through the, the uh, truth part of truth and reconciliation and the healing part to actually move into moving together? And I think that's what the seventh fire prophecy asks of us, to, to move together in a good way for mutual benefit. Thank you so much. Um, um, no more comments from me. I highly recommend her paper. I've read it many times and I'm still only scratching the surface. Uh, this is an honest feedback, just so much to think through, to read it again slowly. Um, I'm, we're going to open the floor for questions. So uh, we're going to extend the session to 10 more minutes. For people who have to go at the top of the hour, uh, this session is being live streamed and recorded on YouTube, so you can catch uh, the question period on the end. Um, on that note, I'm going to turn it over to my co-host, Narayan Wang. Narayan, off to you. Hi, everyone. Um, so if you've got questions, feel free to pop those into the chat. Um, I do see five awesome questions in here already. Um, so. I think to start off with Lorraine Randell, are you are you still with us? I see you there. I'm here. Could you read your question? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, uh, thank you so much, Malini. Just I have so many questions for you, but this is 
probably top of mind for me anyway. Um, I'm really curious about the concept of agency within a relational system. So a lot of the work that I do is around sy systemic design, systems kind of strategic design. And uh, it really assumes a lot of agency um, of the actors that are in the system and, and their capability in shaping environment in all of the different ways that that, that shows up. And I'm really curious, um, you know, in your conversation, you talked about trees being sentient and the space being sentient. And, and I'm really curious about that. Um, if you could just speak about the role of agency and the concept of kind of like making change and how that might happen. Um, from, from a Anishinaabe Gikandaswan perspective is how I would um, approach answering that question, which is that agency, so when we introduce ourselves, agency begins with your name and, and what you're named in the spirit world. For us, you know, we each have a name and those names are often word bundles. Uh, there's a number of different names within there. And so when we think about that, we we are fulfilling and living up to our name that's one of our our um, kind of first principles i guess or one of our teachings and so so agency also comes into play with the spirit helpers and so for us when we have specific helpers like a migaze miguan for example an eagle feather is one of my helpers and uh, a megan actually a turtle rattle i am solely responsible and accountable to those beings that are helping me nobody else and so there's agency in the fact that I accept responsibility for those teachings and that um, if I'm going to share those teachings, I share the protocols of those teachings so, the, so that I, you know, people understand what, uh, what they're being taught and what they can share. So I think uh, for me, I would, that's how I would approach the, the idea of agency within, you know, my understanding of Anishinaabe. Uh, in Dhamma with our wisdom is that there's there's deep agency in the pursuit of ceremony as well. And so we have a lot of ceremonies. And so while there's a collective sort of consciousness in our culture, but there's also individuation. I mean, you have your own clan, you're in relationship to the other clans, you're related to other clans, uh, but you still can seek vision, you know, in, in fasting ceremonies, um, we feast our items. And all of those are your individual gifts. And so the way I would talk about agency is in our language, minigojuin. That means your sacred knowledge bundle. So minigo, that which is given to you, is your win from somebody else, meaning the creator or the universe or your ancestors. And so the recognition that everybody comes to every, say, social innovation process or every lab process, when you're building that container, the recognition that everyone arrives not an empty vessel, but they bring their sacred knowledge bundle. I think that's how you would design processes because often we don't. If you say, um, here's a common one I've seen, in one minute, tell me who you are, <laughs> what your name is, and uh, maybe you know your title or something interesting about you. And then you go around, it takes us seven minutes to introduce ourselves, <laughs> like, you know, so um, to introduce ourselves fully and properly. And so um, in, in when I think about design, I think about designing for that mini Gojuin to be fully present for the authentic self of every participant to arrive and not be dismissed because they're not fitting into the box of here's the stakeholder role that you're playing, you know, in this process. Instead, you know, do you have teachings about Taoism? Do you have teachings about being a Muslim? Do you have teachings? That you can share with us and so when i've asked people to introduce themselves through their sacred knowledge bundle give them time so that that introductory circle i will also say probably needs to be about three hours for you know 20 30 40 people uh, to fully be present and introduce themselves um, and i think that is uh how i would think about agency miigwech beautiful thanks melanie I'll take the next question from Marissa Levine. Is Marissa here? Um, yes, I am. Thank you so much. What a wonderful session. And uh, I just can't thank you enough. Um, I was, you've given a lot of great insights in terms of how to connect better. Uh, but the reality here, certainly in the United States, is one of a very, very polarized uh, society on so many levels. And Again, I'm taking a lot in to think practically about what we can do, but any 
other insights about some first steps to connect across that great divide, mm -hmm. the sacred space. And I love the dancing in the sacred space. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rich. Yeah, thank you. That's a, I think that's a really timely question. You know, right after uh, the murder of, of George Floyd, uh, I did some Gaia sessions with, with Otto and his team and uh, Dr. Angel Acosta um, to talk about race, um, to talk about really difficult, uh, painful topics like that, especially when people have lived and currently live those experiences, right, it can be really emotional. And I recently uh, took some facilitators training and I found it very powerful. Um, Diane Musho Hamilton, and, and she has a, a, I believe a Buddhist and a Zen practice. Um, but what she taught us about was the neur uh, neuroscience. And this was really fascinating. And I've, I've, I've tried this. So neuroscience teaches us that that flight, right? That fight or flight response starts to happen in our bodies when we view differentiation as a threat. So as soon as we hear another opinion, we hear someone with a different life story, someone with a different opinion, um, our nervous system kicks in and our paras, is it parasympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system, those kick in. <clears throat> and that's when you start to feel it, you know, your face gets flushed and you sort of want to get agitated. And, and that polarization is fueled by that. What she recommends, and I, I shared this with the group actually when I was speaking recently, and it got really positive feedback. Um, I shared it with, I was a, a keynote speaker for Environment and Climate Change Canada's 5150 legacy event a couple of weeks ago. And one of the first things you can do is seek consent. And very often we don't do that. We just say, you know, I'm here to talk, I'm going to present, or we're doing a workshop and, you know, here's the agenda. But to, to recognize the agency and the dignity of each person is to seek consent. And so I will, so in that conversation, which was, I think there was about a thousand uh, scientists, mainly from Environment and Climate Change Canada, what I asked them to do was to pour themselves a cup of tea, to ingest what I was saying and say, are you interested in hearing what I have to say about indigenous ways of knowing? Because that's your consent uh, to be here. But pay attention to your body because when I start talking about the Anthropocene or Anthropocene, that might be very familiar, but when I start talking about prophecy, is something going to happen in your body? Is your nervous system going to kick in and say, oh, that's kind of threatening because that's, you know, could be in your, your worldview. That's just, you know, make-believe uh, hooey kind of stuff. And <clears throat> I heard back after that session that many people stayed online for that webinar and have watched it since, um, primarily because there was a, a recognition there of respect respect that I'm not the all knowing, you know, expert, I was really sharing with them something that they consented to wanting to learn about. And that was really significant. So she, she wrote an article in the Harvard Business Review, I can uh, send you that uh, she quoted, which is really um, beautiful because she works in very high conflict zones. So if you can imagine people with long standing <clears throat> um, polarizing issues over very, you know, kind of emotional things like land and land dispossession and, you know, um, different political and ideological types of uh, feelings and, and processes that they're engaged in, uh, that starting to bring everybody down to the, the common experience of the body is a way to, to try to navigate um, that polarization. We've certainly found that by, by offering tea. Um, we haven't done it in person a lot uh, because of COVID, but, but asking everybody even just to sort of do the deep breathing reminds them that they're all human beings and that we we need to sort of be able to recognize when our our bodies take over our minds and then it just feels that polarization so that that would be one thing i would share for um for having those types of difficult conversations and also building containers that are really different go out on the land if you can invite everybody to sit in the forest you know it doesn't have to be a ceremony but that touching of mother earth shifts consciousness. I think you, you know, people are more open when their, their consciousness is shifted versus, okay, we're going to sit in this boardroom and around a board table on chairs and argue, you know, across the table with each other. So miigwech. Wonderful advice. Thank you so much. Thank you.
So I'm going to look over at Joanne and say, do we have time for one more question or how are you feeling? Uh, yes, we do. All right. So um, I'm thinking this might be a good uh, summary. Last question, Melanie. Um, I'll invite Yan to share her question. Um, I'm, I'm hearing a sense of personal significance in this question, and it also seems like a nice way to potentially summarize what we've been talking about today. So Yan, hoping you're still here. Um, I see she's not here. So um, let's see, do we have Bill Van Aeron here? I see he's also had to drop as well. Um, in that case, Joss, I'll pass it over to you uh, for your question. And, and maybe you can also shape it into whatever's alive with you at this point, knowing it's the last question. Yeah, I mean, uh... Yes, yeah, so, so many things here you can take away. I guess the thing that's kind of resonating for me and what I'm, I'm thinking about and hearing is stuff around, um, we're really interested in kind of the axis between kind of quantity and quality. And a lot of what you talk about is kind of slowing down, mm -hmm. you know, three hours to introduce yourself and things like this. And I think that's really getting to the quality kind of aspect, you know, um, that actually quality takes time um, instead of, always trying to do things faster and more and so forth. So, I mean, that was, that's what's kind of come out of this uh, conversation for me. But my question was around um, this, uh, well, we talked a lot about healing, but the question of kind of, how do we heal um, so much of kind of the damage that was done from colonialism? Um, because I feel like that's really key to moving forward. So actually we can't really make progress in any sense um, at this stage without that kind of healing. I think it's the same for an individual, isn't it? You know, if you've had a lot of kind of shock or trauma in your life, you can't actually move forwards until you deal with that or heal in some sense. And I think it's, we're in the same situation with kind of what happened over the past few hundred years in terms of colonialism. And I guess you've already kind of referenced it in a number of ways, but my question was, again, how do we kind of go about that healing process um, with these different kind of societies around the world. Um, actually, I developed the overall network for systems innovation. So we work with a whole pile of, um, you know, in India, in South Africa, in Australia, and so forth. So this, I really actually feel this is actually really an issue in the work that I'm doing, that we can't actually kind of fully move forwards and really, um, yeah, really move forwards and make progress in a sense until we kind of surface that and actually deal with it. And I'm still questioning what, how do you deal with it? Um, what is that healing? Me, Rich. Yeah, I think. I mean, I think that's a wonderful question to um, to wrap our our time together in circle because the focus on healing self and system. I became aware of when I started to work with you know systems change uh, people in the field of doing large scale transformative systems change, and that had been talked about in terms of you know systems transformation, shifting systems. Donella Meadows talks about leverage points. Uh, Otto um, talks about the interior condition of the intervener. And I think all of that uh, really brings attention to the inner work that's required to do outer work because the outer work, so these big, large scale transformative change processes, which are messy, uh, very messy, very complex, involve human beings and human emotions, but also involve all of the other beings that healing is the first step potentially, or a very important step. Uh, and it's a continuous journey. It's not really a destination. And so, you know, lots, lots of folks might think about, uh, for example, grief and unresolved grief, that somehow you become healed from that, but it's always going to be, I think, a process uh, because that's what triggers are, or those reminders that surprise you. So I've worked with People have been on a healing journey for many years and they, they feel like they're quite capable of talking about a, you know, a difficult topic, but then they hear someone else's story or hear it in a certain way and they realize they're still processing that. And I think we're all processing a lot of collective trauma and collective grief. So maybe I'll just bring in my colleague, uh, Thomas Hubel uh, and his, his work on collective, um, collective trauma and collective healing. And it's, it's in, it's, a little bit different than individual-based healing because 
I remember a colleague of mine who's um, a black man in the US and he said, well, that's great that everybody's sitting around in circle and healing themselves, but we're still, you know, we're still facing uh, death on the streets here, you know, by, by police officers. And I thought, yeah, like there is a, a realization that uh, this individual healing uh, is important, but also the collective nature of it. And it, it has a lot to do with uh, what we've been talking about, um, almost like a karma, that there is an energy in the world. Uh, and when that energy is really negative, then it's affecting all of the beings around us. It's affecting Mother Earth. It's like, you know, that experiment when they talked very poorly, like bullied water. I don't know if you've heard of that experiment. And the water changes its shape the negative energy and, and to towards a glass of water versus a water that's being taught uh talked to with love and so i think bringing in words like healing uh compassion love that all of that's really an important part of collective healing uh and and people shy away from that uh, but there are ways to do that i would just maybe recommend and, and from my experience uh, to involve people who are skilled when there's a tipping point that's reached, when, when someone's actually uh, quite traumatized by something, um, has seen a lot of trauma, that there's always a safety net for them. Um, I think that's really important. Uh, we often ask elders to come in uh, when that happens, and that's why we do things in ceremony. So uh, that's an important part of that. But yeah, that's that, to me, if, if more people doing systems work talked about healing, uh, I think that would be really uh, a, a good way to center that message for people and also that healing is okay uh, especially in North American society there's this you know be strong be professional but I remember sitting um, during a workshop that that Peter Senge and I were at uh, and there was a woman who got some really bad news and she was crying and then she apologized profusely and I said wow like you know I didn't understand why she was apologizing so much I mean she was almost embarrassed that she was crying about this tragic news um, because she was trying to be very professional. And I think that, you know, it does a disservice for us to not uh, be aware of the healing journey that people are on and honor that and have that, have this work be a part of that journey. Miigwech. Melanie, a slide. Um, no words can express how grateful I think everyone and myself certainly uh, is for uh, your uh, wisdom, insights, knowledge, and um, and thank you everyone for joining us and, and the Millennium Sly and everyone have a wonderful day, evening, a night, and we will post the videos on YouTube and we'll let you know. Thank you again. Mm. Bye. Bye, Pete. And, and thanks to Narayan and Joss for... Uh,